Let's get started. Uh, any questions from yesterday? Any of you went out last night? Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> any of you went out last night? Yeah, very good. We did. <laughs> Couldn't hear you because we went out last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember, I don't know if it's the same thing still. But uh, I was here mid-90s for a couple of years. And everything cl is closed about 11. Is that still true? No, no. Uh, oh, so you guys did stay up late. Later than 11. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions from yesterday? All right, so I see what we can do. Oh, first thing first, uh, we've had some discussion yesterday. The lunch line was getting too long, too painful. It was decided that the chemists get hungry earlier than anyone else, <laughs> followed by gas turbine people, and the physicists or the theory people never get hungry. <laughs> so we're going to have to finish our lecture about five, ten minutes early. So remind me, well, if you get hungry, raise your hand. It's OK. We're going to go have lunch, OK? All right. So I was thinking about this last night, and how I'm going to be able to cover quantum mechanics and the statistical mechanics in one and a half hour. So bear with me today. I'm not seeking for uh, you to have a mathematical understanding of the problem. Rather, I wanted to just give you an idea. An idea about this thing you may have to work on it, OK, in the next few years, if you truly want to understand reaction kinetics and reaction mechanisms. The big part of the problem is that I'm pretty sure you've all heard the transition state theory. And transition state theory, the simplest theory of reaction kinetics, was formulated on the basis of partition function. And the reason you need to deal with partition functions is because energies are quantized. Partition function in itself, being a concept of statistical mechanics, is a direct consequence of quantum mechanics. So you're going to have to have a basic feeling for why energy is quantized. OK? So I won't torture you with all the math today. What I'm going to do is just present you with a broad idea of what is this equations we are solving, all right, without going into too much detail. <coughs> As we discussed this yesterday, the particle wave duality essentially tells us that an atom is no longer an atom. It has a particle wave duality. The result is that we must approximate where about of this atom, all the electrons inside of an atom, in a probability by probability density function. And that's the wave function, the psi. The psi star is the complex conjugate this, this wave function does not have to be real. And it must satisfy the condition that when you normalize it okay, uh, over the entire spatial domain, then you must be able to find it. And thus, the derivative over the entire spatial domain must give you unity. Okay. If it's a zero, this particle or this system of particles is not there. Okay. Now. This is a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And its origin, the origin of this equation comes from the classical mechanics, as a matter of fact. I do not know why it always shifts. Let me explain the couple of parameters here. The H is the Planck's constant. The original Planck's constant is uh, 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 h bar is h over 2 pi. The original Planck's constant is about 6 times 10 to the negative 34 uh, in a unit of a C, I mean, uh, international unit. V is the potential energy with respect to the spatial coordinate, and this is so-called the Hamiltonian, operating on a wave function, and uh, that's on the right-hand side, is in fact the total energy of the system. And the way how you came about with this formulation is you have the Hamiltonian, in a classical world, you have the kinetic energy plus the 
potential energy. Kinetic energy is momentum squared over 2m, and you bring the mass, and you have the potential function. So you make the uh, identity transformation that Hamiltonian in the microscopic world is h squared <coughs> over 2m, del squared, and the potential function. And you operate this on the wave function, and that's the left-hand side of uh, the Jordan equation. So uh, what I neglect to tell here is there is a very important approximation made for us to move forward. That's the von Oberheim approximation. It states that you can separate the nuclear motion from the electron motions. Electrons being buzzing about much lighter than the nucleus. Therefore, it, it's buzzing around, or they are buzzing around the nuclei much faster than the motion of the nuclei itself. The result is that you can separate a nuclear uh, uh, wave function out, and the other consequence is you can start to do a separation of a variable. Those of us who do mechanical engineering knows what that trick is about. And you separate a spatial dependent function uh, from the time dependent function. You plug this back into the original Schrodinger equation, simplify, you get the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay? That is, the Hamiltonian operated on the time independent wave function is equal to the energy eigenvalue for the system uh, multiplied by the wave function itself. Okay? So that's the bottom line of this whole analysis, not that complicated. Now, I'm sure that all of you have heard of the problem of particle in one-dimensional bonds. And that's a very useful example to illustrate the problem of quantum mechanics. Okay. The problem is basically this. If I have a particle having mass equal to m locked into a one-dimensional box, if it's a potential function as a function of spatial distance, <coughs> is defined as a square well. That is, the particle cannot escape from the box. The box, one dimensional, having a length of L. Outside, the particle is not accessible to the particle. So as far as potential function is concerned, then as we load up over there, what you have is it's zero inside of the box, but it's infinity for outside of the box. Okay. <clears throat> and this problem can be now be taking the uh, uh, potential function uh, 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 operator, throw it out, and the potential function over there is used as a boundary condition. <laughs> and the meaning for that boundary condition as far as the wave function is concerned is it must go to zero at the two sides of the wall. And that's a second order differential equation. We know how to solve it. The solution takes the form that this wave function as a function of x is given by this expression, where L, if you recall, is the length of the, of the uh, uh, one dimensional well. And n being an integer, okay? And uh, obviously, when n is equal to zero, psi is zero. That's the trivial solution of the problem. The particle has zero uh, energy. And when n is equal to one and above, you, the wave function essentially assume a sinusoidal uh, 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 evolution as a function of n, okay? And what is more important here is the result directly relevant to us is the energy eigenvalue on the right-hand side of that equation. And as you can see, it's quantized. It's a Planck's constant times the quantum number n squared over a m over l squared. All right? It's a very simple solution. So you're asking me now, OK, what happens if I assign the solution to, well, it doesn't say that how big the system must be, right, to obey this rule. What if you apply to me? Somebody of the order of 100 kilogram. Am I 100 kilogram? Yeah. Little lighter than that. Uh, and I have to move about in a one dimensional space, or for that matter, three dimensional space, in a quantized manner? The answer is no. It turns out that this is all a number game. If you look at this energy 
hiking back expression. NH squared, or HM squared divided by NML squared. If we were to apply this equation to an atom, okay, just another hydrogen atom, what we find is that taking N squared out, you find the Planck's constant to be of the order of a six times 10 to the negative 34 SI limit. <coughs> divided by eight, the mass of a hydrogen atom is about one divided by the Avogadro number. Okay, so it's one over six times 10 to 23 gram, and you need to multiply this by 10 to the negative three to get to the kilogram. Okay, so this is the mass of a hydrogen atom in a unit of kilogram. Let's say this atom is moving about in a one-dimensional box of the length scale of one meter. So you have one squared. If you look at this, you realize that this E, you ask, well, what is the magnitude of this energy for a hydrogen atom at a 300 Kelvin? Taking one dimension movement, and we'll derive this expression later. The equal partition principle tells us that it roughly is about a half kT. And forget about a pair, we're just going to do an order half. Forget about a half, we're just going to do an order magnitude analysis. The Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times negative 10 to negative 24. Again, SI unit, times 300 Kelvin. So the left hand side is of the order of 10 to the negative 20, 21. The right hand side, of course, n over here, have to assume a value greater than 10 to the 10 in order to match the order magnitude of the left hand side and the right hand side. So now if quantum number is of the order of a 10 to the 10 for this motion of a particle in the box, it's literally a continuous function. There isn't any difference. You say between one to two, it's a factor of two. Between 1,000 and 1,001, it's 0.1%. When you get to 10 to the 10, you add one more integer. It's a continuous function. It is for that reason that even though the solution <coughs> gave us a quantized description for its possible energy, in reality, an hydrogen atom move about in the space of the dimension of importance to us continuously, we cannot com assume energy in a continuous fashion. Is that, is that clear? And I will show that this is not the case for vibration or rotation. Only for translation, it works. Now if you extend this to a three-dimensional space because the, 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 the motions in three uh, x, y, z compared to one-dimensional <coughs> box, essentially are orthogonal to each other, so we can add the energy up. Uh, so the total energy for translation of an atom, or a cluster of atom, or a molecule, uh, in a three-dimensional box of a volume given by L to the power of three, is given by this expression. Okay, leave that expression on the side, we'll come back to visit it later. Okay, and I know you won't have time to follow all the maths, I just want to give you a rough idea of how this thing works. If I apply this problem to a simple harmonic oscillator, say you have a diatomic undergoing oscillation, what I wish to know is that is the energy you can assume or have for this diatomic harmonic oscillator motion continuous or discrete? And if it's discrete, how wide is the energy spacing? Okay. So physically, you look at this problem. If I apply Hooke's law to this harmonic oscillator problem, in a classical me mechanics, you're going to essentially find a ball rolling around a parabolic potential function. Without a friction, this ball shall roll forever. And in classical mechanics also, the ball can oscillate with any energy, okay? In classical world, 
I will show this is not the case. So if you take the potential function for this motion, apply Hooke's law, you have half kx squared, where x is the displacement from the equilibrium, the lowest part of the potential energy curve. And uh, don't worry about omega for now. Those are just uh, 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 various transformation we do. And don't worry about the math here. And I just want to show you the result. <coughs> Turns out this energy eigenvalue after you solve the one, the one dimensional Hamilton independent Schrodinger equation. Yes. N, which is the quantum number, H mu. N being a quantum number, and I must assume integer. H is the Planck's constant, mu is the frequency, and in combustion or in spectroscopy, typically we express frequency in a unit of a wave number, sine beta minus one. It's a frequency because if a mu multiplied by speed of light gives you the unit of a second minus one, so it's a frequency that transform, can transform from one to another. How many of you work on spectroscopy? Okay, so this concept is clear to you. Energy units, in terms of wave number, frequency, Joule, Berg, and so on. All of them are transformable, okay? Sometimes you have to use the speed of light, sometimes you have to use a Planck's constant to try to convert the units from one to another. So there's a couple of consequences from resulting from this expression. First, <coughs> I may have discussed this issue yesterday very briefly. Okay. The lowest the quantum number is zero. And as the lowest the quantum number is achieved at a zero Kelvin for a macroscopic system. Therefore, you see from this equation that as far as vibration or uh, vibration is concerned, this energy is non-zero at the lowest level. The interpretation of that is even at a zero Kelvin, you're gonna see, you're looking into a crystal, you're gonna be able to find, you won't be able to find it, you can only conjecture it. Uh, the atoms are still vibrating or oscillating at a small amplitude. That's the first thing. The second thing is the following. This wave number is of the order of 1,000 wave number. It's frequency factor. Multiplied by speed of light, three times 10 to the 10, what you get is, as far as frequency is concerned, the three times 10 to the 13, second minus one. So typically, harmonic oscillator, when you apply to molecular motion, or atomic motion, inside of a molecule, it does this frequent motion at a typical time scale of hundreds, tens to hundreds of femtoseconds. per second. It's a very fast motion. This number, in fact, is already give you a clue about the A factor for dissociation reactions. Suppose you were to break a carbon-carbon bond. How does that bond break? Well, you're gonna have to transfer some energy into it. But when you transfer some energy into this molecule, it essentially undergoes larger and a larger amplitude vibration, okay? until you can overcome this bound energy for it to dissociate. But that's the energy. You are bounded by this frequency of oscillation, right? So as far as time scale is concerned, the A factor is around 10 to the 13, second minus one. Does that make sense? So when you look at a reaction model, you see some of the A factors, those are for unimolecular dissociation reaction at a high pressure limit. Typically assume a value around 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, in some case 10 to the 15. It's a because of this fact, okay? <coughs> All right, 
So that's the vibrational motion. Now for rigid erota, that's the last motion we have to worry about. Taking a stick, okay, and you rotate it. And you need to define the moment of inertia. <coughs> moment of inertia in mechanical engineering undergraduate uh, curriculum is in the dynamics class, junior year class. Okay. You take the center of the mass for a linear structure, already, and you take the mass, well, assuming in this case all the mass are centered on the atoms, and the atoms are bounded into a chemical bond, into a structure. You take the mass multiplied by the distance squared between the atom and the center of mass that gives you the moment of inertia. Long story short, the solution for this problem, again, is quantized with energy eigenvalue for rotation given us J times J plus one times this thing called the rotational constant. Again, it's typically expressed <coughs> in the form of wave number. Okay. Where J is the quantum number. With degeneracy, it's a small J plus one. Now, a couple of things I want to explain. First of all, this rotational constant is inversely proportional to moment of inertia. <coughs> In other words, the smaller the stick given quantum number, the greater the rotational energy is going to be. Okay. Long sticks are floppy. They won't give you much because when I goes to the size of a chalk, already, this B value is so small <coughs> that it's not important to count for. Anyhow, the first and second issue is degeneracy. Degeneracy is a concept and in order to see where it's coming from, you have to do the math, and I won't go into it. But let me just explain. Degeneracy is number of times the energy eigenvalue can assume this exactly shape. All right? There are that many number of solutions that give identical energy eigenvalue expression. Leave the concept for the time being, and I'll come back to this issue later. Now, I said there won't be any homework. There won't be any exams or tests. And now you're already equipped. This rotational constant is typically of the order of a one wave number. We talked about this yesterday. Why is the air molecule transparent to visible light? It's transparent to visible light because you have no vibrational or rotational energy ladder to absorb this photon energy in that wavelength range. You can try out with yourself. Remember, a harmonic oscillator describing molecular vibration is typically a thousand wave number. In the case of a rotation, it's a one wave number. And you're going to be easily proved that oxygen and nitrogen are transparent to visible light because there are no energy ladder for this photon to be absorbed by this molecule. That makes sense? Okay. Take what I say not to that seriously, because I have to go through all these things quick, and it's not going to be concise or rigorous. But nonetheless, you can do back of envelope calculation. You have this energy eigenvalues. You ask an animal. These are, after all, potential energies. These are, after all, ways with which you can organize energy. It's a bookshelf. The solution of quantum mechanics, as far as energy eigenvalue is concerned, basically tells you where is the energy level you can assume if you're an atom or a molecule. 
Okay. That's a bookshelf. All right. Some shelves are down below. Some shelves are up. Okay. And it doesn't give us thermodynamic quantities. Yeah. Go ahead. So my, my question with this, I guess, before we keep moving is sure. that kind of the foundation of this analysis was okay. We can't use Newtonian physics to describe atomic motion or describe these phenomena. But it seems like as soon as we get past the Schrodinger equation, we immediately use classical physical representations of, for instance, vibration and rotation again. So it just always seemed odd to me that you can make that jump. You know, for instance, does, does it make sense to think of the uh, diatomic molecule as actually two things vibrating next to each other or rotating physically? Indeed, Hooke's law is a conception of classical mechanics. And when we treat a rigid, when we treat the rotational motion, we also assume that it is a classical description. We do so because we don't know anything better. Right. So that's one thing I'm glad you asked of this. One of the things that you have to know is, I will make one suggestion to you. Next time when you write a paper, as a graduate student, you have to and write papers, right? And you have to make conclusions. Just do this once and once for yourself. Go through your paper, write down every bloody assumption. Implied, implicit, and explicit. Starting from quantum mechanics. If you talk about a vibration frequency, all these things are included in it. Write down all of your assumptions, whether you made an assumption, or Boltzmann made of that assumption, or Gibbs made that assumption, whoever. Okay. And if you can feel this assumption, this all the assumptions you made in one page, you're very good. <laughs> Remember one thing: everything we do is an approximation of the nature. And you dig a little down deeper, you find holes, many of them. And sometimes you wonder after a page of assumption, how can this thing to be right and then? All right. It's a very good exercise. It gives you humility of the work that you do. So indeed, we've applied all of the classical mechanical description of motions into a quantum mechanical description of motion. We don't know anything better. If you ask me, are there anything else better? Well, sure, there must be. But the other thing while we're at it, let me just stay on this issue a little bit. Most of you are mechanical engineering students, right? Second year, college math, you have to do second order PDE. You get all these Bessel functions, spherical harmonics, and whatnot. I, I don't know about you, when I was a sophomore, taking this stuff, I was not fond of it. Not really. I was not fond of it because <coughs> that time I never understood why I have to learn second order PDE. Later on, I know that all this thing, the nature we describe. Once you put the conservation equation together, they happen to be second order. Why second order? It's because of linearized the theory. That is, Newton said that uh, the force and acceleration, one is a cause, the other is an effect. I don't know anything in between, so let me throw in a proportionality. That's the mass. OK? That's called the linearized the theory. You have conductivity and heat conduction. The cause is temperature gradient. The effect is energy heat flux. The proportionality, conductivity. Is that really correct? Well, we know conductivity is a function of temperature. And if you have a temperature variation spatially, this linearized theory is not necessarily right. Do we know anything better? No, we don't. And is it because of a linearized 
phenomenological law that led us to solve second order PDE, if you don't understand what I mean. You have a flux, take a control volume, you take a flux coming from one side, you take a flux leaving the other side. You take a difference that's accumulation of whatever you are counting for inside the volume, right? Divided by dx, then you have a second order differential equation. That's where this whole thing comes from. You ask, well, well, nature really operate a second order PDE? Think about those things. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, since you bring this point, can I also, uh, uh, and about this uh, discussion on the Schrodinger equation, uh, all these quantum numbers, which are essentially the integers that appear in the periodic solutions. Correct. Doesn't that also suggest that the Schrodinger equation, or the governing equation of everything should be second order as well? Because it's a Laplacian which gives... That's right, yeah. Well, uh, even the Schrodinger equation is second order PDE. We saw it, right? Right. <laughs> Stell yeah. squared. All right. It's all the same at the end. All right, we're all inferenced, we're all students of Newton. If you ask why you have to learn Bessel functions because of Newton, it's because of phenomenological law of linearized cause effect dependency. The scaling factor is the property. Conductivity, diffusivity, those are properties, and including mass. All righty. All right, let's not to diverge too much on this. I can talk about this for hours. So let me move on, OK? Is that, did I answer your question? Or, well, rather, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> let's assume this stuff to be right until we're proven wrong. At this level, we're already dealing with approximations. That's the statement I can make, OK? So we have this energy eigenvalue. So you ask the question, then what? How do we put molecules with different state energy into this macroscopic version? And how do we connect between quantum mechanics, the allowable energy level, with something you can measure, like a temperature, like a pressure? What is the statistical mechanical description of pressure? Okay. So to do that, we need to learn something about Maxwell Boltzmann energy distribution. You had that stuff before? Roughly, right? If you haven't had it, it's not that difficult. So if you look at how energy is distributed, or potentially how energy is distributed for a molecule, all right, what you find is it's a postulate by Maxwell and Boltzmann, OK? And it says that the energy density of a state, rho e, that's the number of ways you can organize a certain energy uh, over energy state between ei to ei to dei is described by this equation. What this basically says is that how energy is going to be distributed is that you always go with an exponential decay function. In other words, Lehman's interpretation of this postulate is most molecules or most of the things like to stay in a low energy state. This is an exponential decay function. So the largest value, keeping in mind i is the quantum number, for e sub i is zero. Okay? And that has the highest probability. And it just undergo exponential decay. Most of the things like to stay lazy. So this is a ratio. The denominator over here is basically the molecular partition function. That's a lowercase q. It says that for a molecule, the partition function residing in the volume V at a temperature T, the partition function as a statistical description for this uh, one molecule system is given by the sum of all possible ways you can do this uh, as an exponential function, and that's the Boltzmann factor. Now, every time I talk about this, I'm a little shaky because uh, this is a one of the part. As a postulate, I don't quite understand it. It's a, go, it's a backward fudge, okay? This is essentially used to fit everything we know about pressure, about internal energy, and so on. I'll show you a little later. And it's for the same reason, do you know 
How did the boatsman die? Suicide. He committed suicide. Okay. If you keep thinking this for too long, <laughs> <laughs> it may be dangerous. <laughs> Every time I go through that, I feel uncomfortable. But live with it. It's a posture. So now the next thing you need to do is to recognize the total hamiltonian for a system. There's a sum of a translational, rotational, vibrational, electronic uh, uh, hamiltonian. Those are after all orthogonal motion can be decoupled from each other. So you can <coughs> solve the particle in a box problem, vibrational, rotational problem separately as energy are uh, <coughs> isolated from each other. And the result is the energy eigenvalues are also additive. Okay. Then you ask the next question, when I have all this energy now, I have a bookshelf for rotational energy possible, and I have a shelf for vibrational energy. You say how many ways I can arrange this energy, organize this energy. And that is this statistics is a product. <coughs> There are five ways to organize translational energy, five ways to organize rotation. The total is 25. Are we OK with that? All right. So let's look at the translational partition function. Why we need to do that will become clear quickly. If you look at the translational partition function, you plug in the energy eigenvalue from the particle in a box problem, now in three dimension, into this expression. You can't evaluate the sum by recognizing the fact that this is almost a con continuous function with respect to the quantum number. You can transform the finite summation to an integral, and there is a analytical solution available for it. And this partition function molecule is 2 pi mkt divided by Planck's constant squared times v. v is the volume. That's l to the power of 3. We'll leave this expression here for a little bit. We'll come back to that to, the la to it later. You go to rotational partition function. You have now uh, the energy eigenvalue plug into the Boltzmann factor. You have the degeneracy now, plug it, in, plug it into the expression. Okay, and what you get is over here by making the assumption that the J is come from a finite summation you can go to an integral, that's a huge assumption. Okay. What you get is a rotational partition function is a kT over B. B remember is the rotational constant, inversely proportional to moment of inertia. I recall yesterday I talked about a symmetry number. When you do group additivity, you have to consider the symmetry number. Okay. If you look at the partition function, and this is, after all, equivalent to saying how many ways I can see the energy to be organized. And down at the end, you have to worry about <coughs> whether you have symmetry. So if I have a perfectly symmetric stick, if I orient it this way, I orient it that way, there's no difference. It's indistinguishable. The result is the symmetry number for the stick is 2, and you have to correct for it. Okay. The entropy correction comes from this theta through the rotational partition function, as we will see. Okay. So this symmetry number, how many of you have to use symmetry number in your research? A few of you. Okay, let me discuss this a little bit. Rotational symmetry number essentially is linked to entropy. And ask the question that how many configurations in a molecule that will become indistinguishable, that is indistinguishable from each other. Take, for example, methane. Methane is tetrahedral. Okay. What would be the symmetry number for methane? The answer is 12. Why is it 12? It's tetrahedral. You can assume this is the rotational axis strong. You can rotate this three times, leading to three identical, indistinguishable configurations. Right? You can now label each hydrogen atom. Rotate the second one up. You 
you again can do one, two, three. The total of four hydrogen atoms, three times four is 12. So for methane, the symmetry number is 12. What about a benzene? Keep in mind, we had this discussion yesterday. Because of a pi electron conjugation, the four carbon carbon bond, the six carbon carbon bond are equivalent. Therefore, it's a perfect hexagon. What would be the symmetry number for benzene? <coughs> Again, it's 12. You can rotate this hexagon six times along this rotation of axis. You get back a perfect spaceship for identical geometry configuration. You can flip this thing over and do that again. So it's two times six, that's also 12. Okay. A methyl radical, <coughs> what is its symmetry now? First of all, what is the structure of a methyl radical? It's planar. It's sp3. Once you remove the hydrogen from methane, it becomes sp2. All right. And therefore, this is six. Now, one of the things with for mechanical engineer, I've been teaching mechanical engineers for a long time, and one of the things that I find it somewhat difficult is that, you, that the basic chemistry knowledge in applying these things is important, as you can see. Okay. You have to know methane is tetrahedral, not planar. But then if you take go from methane to methyl radical, remove the hydrogen, suddenly this thing wants to be planar. And the geometry of it impact how you assign rotational constant, impact how you determine entropy other thermodynamic property. One more example we're done. Ethylene. Anyone? It's a symmetric planar about symmetric about these two axes. And it's all about how many times you flip this thing to get a geometry that's a, that looks identical to the previous one. All right. all right, go to vibration. Now for vibrational partition function, what you're going to find is that you replace the energy eigenvalue in this <laughs> uh, the Boltzmann factor by n plus one half times h mu. Again, you assume that this can be transformed from a finite summation to an integral and applicable to certain conditions when temperature is not too low. And at the end, what you get is this expression, the vibration of partition function. Okay? Don't look into detail. I'll come back to this later. Lastly, you have electronic partition function. Let me explain roughly that what this means. According to Pauli's exclusion principle, you shall fill in the lower electronic orbital, atomic orbital first. You're filling in two in two, one S, two in two S, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the valence electron sits on the top. And you can excite this electron electronically. It's not right. You can excite a certain valence electron to the next orbital. That's the excited electronic state. The fact that the flame looks blue is because excited a CH radical and the emission of it, electronic excitation. Once you get electronically excited, it can spontaneously jump back down. In doing so, emit a photon. That's how flame looks blue. And this electronic partition function is quite simply expressed as something called a degeneracy, G sub 1, that's for the ground state 
and they have a higher electronic state at a uh, 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 value of E2 relative to the ground state and so on. Now, the higher uh, 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 electronic states usually are not that important for combustion application, or mostly for, water, for our epi uh, uh, purpose. For chemical reactions, we just need to know what this G value is. And that's the electronic degeneracy. And that's a ways, roughly a ways, how you can organize electron spin. So if you have a molecule where you have no degeneracy, G is one, unity. Okay. When you have a single radical, unpaired electron, G is equal to two, because you can have spin up, spin down. Rule of thumb for free radical, it's two. If you have a diradical, moreover, if it's a triplet diradical, then you have degeneracy of three. Okay. That's the kind of thing you have to worry about. All right. Most important, we need to move on to the <coughs> Penelope example. For statistical mechanical description of a macroscopic system in which you can do measurement, you need to know the volume. You need to know the temperature. Those are thermodynamic properties. Okay, and you need to know the number of molecules in the system. Number or mole, they are the same thing. And you ask the question, what I can do to relate between microscopic information? How do I relate <coughs> this to macroscopic information? The lowercase q is a molecular partition function. Now I have n number of molecules in the system I shall consider with a volume equal to V, temperature equal to T. You ask the question, how many ways I can organize molecules into allowable energy levels? This ensemble partition function is related to the molecular partition function raised to the power of n, n being the number of this molecule divided by n factorial. All right. Again, this is a postulate. Gibbs made it. But this can be traced back to statistical statistics. And if you do the coin flip down the bottom, I want to do want to explain this so you don't get too lost over here. Suppose I have three molecules, or rather three coins. Okay? I get a head and a tail as two possibility. Head and a tail as two possibility is my Q, lowercase Q, that's a molecular partition function. You first ask how many ways, if I toast the three coins, how many number of ways can I get? Well, there are a total of eight. Coin one, two, through three, you can do head, 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 or you can do tail, 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 and so on. You have eight possibilities. All right. But that's not a fair because the coins are indistinguishable. You have a three oxygen molecules. They're not indistinguishable distinguishable from each other. The result is that you have to account for that. And here I labeled them, colored them. That is head, tail, 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 head, tail. I indistinguishable from each other. If you can't tell, that's coin number one, coin number two, or coin number three. So the total number of possibility is one, two, three, and four. And that, in terms of statistics, is 2 to the power of 3. That's the number of 8 outcomes divided by 3 minus 1, 3 being the number of coins minus 1 factorial. Okay. Or it's q to the power of n divided by n minus 1 factorial. Of course, when n is very large, n minus 1 is approximately n. Well, that's a mathematically, if you think a little bit, it's not a very comfortable assumption. But let it be. And that's how we get that. OK. <coughs> Are we OK with that? All right. The torture is about over. Don't worry. So you take now this molecular partition function, take the one, uh, a molecular partition function, expand it into translational, rotational, vibrational, electronic contribution. Raise the power of n. You can rearrange this equation to show the first the translational part is that, then you have a rotation vibration electronic later. And you apply, 
apply the Stirling approximation, plug this back in, a little bit of math later, what do you get is for the translational partition function, it's the molecular partition function times the exponential e to the power of 1 divided by number of molecules raised to the power of n. Okay. All right. So you say, well, I have the microscopic description of allowable energy levels. How do I determine the internal energy of an ensemble having n number of molecules residing in volume B at temperature T? This mean energy is the sum <coughs> of individual energy level weighed by the density of energy state. Sum over, you get a mean energy. And that, in fact, is internal energy. And if I were to play with the math a little bit, what you find is that the mean energy is kT squared, the derivative of natural log of partition function with respect to temperature. I know by now you're, you're lost with math, but don't worry. I just want to show you something very quickly. And now if you plug in the expression for translational partition function, you can manipulate, recall that this capital Q is related to the lowercase q through this expression. You take a natural log of it, you're going to get a natural log of lowercase q. Okay, the rest are natural log of E is unity and N flip to the front, then you have natural log of N hang out as a subtraction term. You then go back to the translational partition function and you take a natural log of that. And you have three over two natural log of T. The rest terms are hang out. Don't worry about them because once you take a derivative of that with respect to temperature, all the rest of the term drops away. What is left? 3 over 2 times t. Okay. After all this is done, what you find is internal energy for the translational motion part is 3 over 2 times n k t. And that's for n, n number of molecules in a system. Therefore, for each molecule, they should assume an energy of 3 over 2 times kT. For each translation of motion, therefore, it's 1 half of kT. That's where this whole thing comes from. Are we OK with that? All right. Pressure. You ask, what is pressure? What is a microscopic description of pressure? To do that, we needed to define another ensemble, so let me explain. I have a canonical ensemble. I have n number of molecule with a volume V at a temperature T. In this system, this is the canonical ensemble. <coughs> I have many microcanonical ensembles. Each would have, for the first one, I have n1 number of such molecule occupying energy level E sub 1. Okay. And again, they can be populated through the entire volume. So NVE ensemble is the micro canonical. And I can have quite many of them. Okay, so, and if I generalize, I would have EJ, MJ, EJ, and V. Now, applying the first law of thermodynamics on each of this micro canonical ensemble within a canonical ensemble, what do we find? is the internal energy is essentially equal to the volume boundary work of a minus P sub J, that's the microscopic pressure of each microcanonical ensemble 
multiplied by volume displacement of itself. Okay. In other words, the microscopic pressure is given as a negative of dE dV. You then plug this expression, microscopic distribution of pressure, into this equation. Again, it's the microscopic contribution of pressure weighed by density of energy state divided by total molecular partition function. What you get is this expression. Again, we shall not account for vibration or rotation for the time being, just worry about the translation. The beauty of a natural log of a Q throw away most of the things, and we, when you take a derivative with respect to V, everything else drops out. What's left is if you take this derivative at a constant n and a t, that's essentially number of molecules divided by volume. And what is this expression? P equal to kT over n over V. That's the ideal gas law. Okay. Therefore, the statistical mechanical description of pressure is intimately related to the, the, the origin of the ideal gas law. And as you all know, ideal gas law was the first constructed empirically, entirely based on observation. And this is what explains it. All right? Go ahead. It seems kind of funny that you can have this microscopic pressure that you use in that work term. Because I guess when I think of pressure, isn't that kind of a bulk property of the volume of gas? So how would you, now down on the molecular level, can you say that the work done by that one molecule is pressure times volume? This is the work done by the, a, a group of a molecule all having energy equal to E sub O, or E sub T, and so on. The origin of that derives from the fact that you have the total number of states, a fractional number of states, having energy equal to E sub I divided by KT and the fraction of them is given by this expression. In other words, a low energy state would have a greater probability of population than a high energy state. And for any property of interest to you, if you have this amount of P, and you call this the lack of it, any property of interest to you must be an integral, or rather the sum of its microscopic property weight over this distribution, okay? Therefore, the question then becomes, what is the microscopic pressure? The first law of thermodynamics basically says the energy is conserved. That can be applied to macroscopic system or microscopic system. You essentially pull out atom number five, number 16, they all have the same energy. You ask for this group of molecules or atoms, how does the pressure when you apply the first law of thermodynamics, linking E sub i, that's the internal energy of this molecule can have, okay? Relating to its volume work, boundary expansion or contraction work. And that gave rise to the fact that for pressure, this becomes a negative DEJ dV. Does that make sense? It does, but I feel like aren't you using pressure to define itself then? I mean, if the point is to derive what pressure it is, are you kind of oh. assuming by saying it now, okay, you have a microscopic pressure? Correct. The same thing I did that you didn't quite feel uncomfortable is the energy itself. In other words, the mean energy of the system, or the total energy of the system, is a sum of individual energy weighted by how it is populated and distributed. Okay? So a macroscopic property is this expression basically says that the mic a macroscopic property, how is it related to microscopic property? And to that end, the definition for pressure didn't change. There is a microscopic pressure, there's a macroscopic pressure. Okay? Okay. That's correct. And you can, for that, you can invent anything beyond the pressure, as long as you can measure it. And the pressure, if I do have a pressure, then macroscopically or microscopically is exhibited in doing boundary work. There's the argument. 
and therefore, if I apply first law of thermodynamics, energy is conserved. I must have this microscopic expression for pressure. That's that one. Okay. You have to define this property in order to use statistical mechanical expression. And this usually is defined by what is measurable. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, go ahead. What's the meaning of boundary work here? I'm sorry? What is the meaning of boundary work when you uh, describe all these small ensembles? Oh, the boundary work came from the concept of a piston engine. Okay. Uh, but you have inside the pressure. Sense. I'm sorry? Uh, in the microscopic system that we are considering, there's a random distribution of molecules. Yeah. And we are tagging, uh, tagging the different molecules with one energy level. Right. And we are calling them one group. Right. So what's the physical meaning of a uh, PDV in this, for this system, for this independent group of one? OK. What this says is, if this is a piece of I, OK, uh, these are independent molecules anyhow. It just says there is a fractional molecule lies in energy at E sub I. So now suppose you have two groups of molecules, one having energy equal to E sub one, the other having energy equal to E sub two. And you have a part of this molecule having any one of them doing the piston work, okay? There's nothing against that. You have kindergarten kids, boys and the girls. You ask the boys to do the work, you ask the girls to do the work. But there are seven boys and two girls. Rather, seven girls and two boys, whichever how you define it. Does that make sense? It's uh, so you're distributing the total work then into uh, It's a sum of work. Yeah. It's a weight by number of them. Okay, the fraction of them. <coughs> so does does that con make sense? So yeah. does the concept similar to partial pressure? It's partial pressure, yeah, so to speak. Okay. It's a partial pressure down not on a component, but on a class of a molecule. Mm -hmm all having same internal energy. Does that make sense? All right. All right, so the important point here is I made a link between statistical mechanics and macroscopically observable properties. That's important. I want to do that just to say that statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics are not wrong. All right, if you ask me it's right, I can't tell you. But that's good enough for now. Am I, are we supposed to take a break now? It's one and a half hour. It's start eight, uh, oh, okay. 45, we got we, 10, 15. 10, 15, we take a break, right? There's another half hour, okay. All right, entropy. All righty. In general, you're not going to be able to understand the true meaning of entropy until you deal with statistical mechanics. We said that, that entropy is a measure of randomness of a system. What, what is this randomness we actually measure? Is it really about the spatial position of an atom? It's not. The statistical mechanical description for entropy is that if you take this is that if you look at the previous description in terms of a canonical ensemble, NVT, decompose this into a micro-canonical ensemble of N1, E1, N2, E2, and so on. All right. So this is a mechanical description for entropy, is that it is equal to the number of ways you can organize the molecule at a given temperature into that many of microcanonical ensemble. Okay? You have this class of people. In the evening, you all stay in the dormitory. And there are, well, here maybe 25 rooms. The question is, how many ways you can arrange you guys into these 25 rooms? Already. And that is 
given by omega. It's a natural log of omega n. That's the number of ways we talked about. And for that, omega sub n is n factorial divided by n1 factorial and 2 factorial and so on. You don't believe me? Take a 10 of you. There are five rooms mutated. And each room can fit two. So the lowercase n is equal to two. You go through this math. It'll give you exactly the right number. Okay. So that's a statistical mechanical description. You apply the Stirling rule again. Again, I don't want you to look into math. I just focus on the concept. You apply the Stirling approximation. Decompose the second term into something that's directly related to capital N and the lowercase n. Some math manipulation later, what do you find? That by and large, entropy is related by this expression. Okay. And what do you find that the first term is related to the very definition of entropy? All right, you cancel out the K, then it's internal energy over T. All right. Now, the important thing to move on from here is that you now are able to express entropy, and for that matter, every thermodynamic property in terms of molecular microscopic properties, in terms of mass for the translational motion. For example, the entropy contribution from translation is given by this expression. Where it's coming from, there's an E, there's an expression, then there's a Q over there. Jumping through all of this, give me your, we're talking about vibrational partition function. And at the end of this lecture notes, I have a summary of how thermodynamic chemical, thermochemical properties may be expressed as a function of microscopic properties. There's a microscope of properties include the mass of the molecule, include the vibration frequency, include the rotational constant, somewhere here, over here. That's over here, and so on. For diatomics, for linear polyatomic, and for a nonlinear polyatomic. Again, the expressions are not important unless you need to use them. All right. What I want to summarize through this very short discussion about quantum mechanics is indeed energies are quantized in a microscopic world. But don't be scared of it. And once it is quantized, statistical so mechanics recast this whole solution in the form of macroscopically observable <coughs> properties. Those are pressure temperature, internal energy, specific heat, and entropy. And you go back to where that table we presented the last time. You ask the question, how do I get that table? How do we go get entropy specific heats? Well, what do we need to know microscopically? You need to know the vibration frequency. Those are molecular parameters. And you need to know the rotational constant. The rotational constant is related to molecular geometry. Where do you get this information today? Mostly we do that by quantum chemistry calculation. How many of you had done quantum chemistry calculation? How many of you plan to do quantum chemistry calculation for your PhD work? Okay. For those of you who develop a reaction mechanism, I ask you perhaps to do one thing. You all have, you must have the code called Gaussian. Mopro, 
there's a couple of standard quantum chemistry package available in your school's computer. Okay. Play with it just for a week. You may get a hook onto it. It provides you with a lot of answer. Might not be accurate answer. But if you were to determine those properties, now they, the Gaussian code can spit out those properties for you. Okay. Now, let me ask a couple of you can use the quantum chemistry code. You use it for the purpose of calculating potential energy surface. I saw one other have used the quantum chemistry package. Yes, what do you use the code for? Well, which code do you use, by the way? Uh, mostly Gaussian, a little bit Gaussian. of Gaussian. Okay. Usually trying to type in individual recombinants. Okay, through the potential energy surface, right? Okay. All right, so again, in principle, this thermodynamic properties can be calculated from first the principle with two pages approximation assumptions you are able to do that, first of all. Second of all, the concept of partition function is critical for us to move forward in, understand, in understanding reaction mechanism. Okay. And then come back down to enthalpy of formation. How do we determine that? I have on Friday a special topic on how do you use quantum chemistry code to determine all of this property or right to estimate all of this property. I'll talk about this issue then. This is also the result of a solution of Tommy dependent Schrodinger equation. The last point I want to make in this lecture uh, uh, section is the following. And I'll tell you my own experience going through this transformation. When I was a very young college student, I was too lazy to remember anything, especially the chemistry part of the story. So I had a tremendous fascination about quantum chemistry. And indeed, I threw myself as a PhD student into that. My advisor then, Michael Franklin, didn't want me to go do that stuff. Okay, He was out of town for two weeks, and I started to play with the code. Well, of course. I went to take quantum chemistry, statistical mechanics before that. And I started to play with the code. And I find it fascinating. So I spent the first 10 years of my faculty career on fiddling with quantum chemistry. Then one day I got bored with it. I got bored with it because everybody started to use it. It becomes a black box. Now quantum chemistry codes are not black box. You have to know how to interpret the results. The issue here is it's a very powerful method. It can give you, always give you an answer. If you're in doubt with a, you want to know a thermochemical <coughs> property, it can give you an answer. If you want a potential energy surface from that you determine the rate constant, it can also give you an answer. All right. The trouble is you have to know how accurate how reliable this answer is. Already. Yes. Then it is for that reason that I start to deal with exceptions again. I don't like exception. So pretty much I am doing a lot less now nowadays than before I moved back to do experiment. Already. Okay. Now let's move on to the part that most of you probably came here for. Reaction mechanisms. That will lecture number three. How many of you had courses that uh, described the explosion limits of hydrogen? <coughs> All of you, so I don't have to discuss that stuff, right? Mechanism of methane oxidation. little less. NTC behavior. Oh, you all you did that. All right. And uh, uh, high hydrocarbon. 
mechanism of benzene aromatics. You all did that. Great. So now what I'm going to teach you here. <laughs> all right, first thing first, for those of you who haven't heard it, we kept talking about this yesterday briefly already, the distinction between global reaction and elementary reaction. Now, if you look at the overall process of oxidizing hydrogen, all right, producing water as a complete combustion product, this process is known as a global reaction process. What this referred to uh, is that the reactants enter into a reactor, and the water comes out from the reactor. All right. In reality, you never find a two hydrogen molecule no, reactor with oxygen. Why is it? No probability for three molecules to simultaneously collide with each other. Chances are this. You go to a market, you bump into a friend. That's very probable. Chances are simultaneously you bump into two friends who are also not with each other. It's almost zero. Agree? And that dictates this whole thing. Elementary refers to those process that requires physical collision. Like two hydrogen atoms colliding each other, the outcome just may be in a hydrogen molecule. As later on we will learn, this is, even that is not going to be the case. Without a third body, you cannot easily, until you get to very large molecules, to bind the two radicals together. The characteristics of elementary reaction is that it requires collision. It must also be reversible. Okay? Like a two hydrogen atom, we combine to form a <coughs> hydrogen molecule. Likewise, hydrogen molecule can be dissociated into two hydrogen atoms. So all re elementary reactions, by definition, are reversible. And that is why when you download a reaction model, you find that you always find equal sign. The equal sign is not an equal sign. It's directional error going to the right and the left. Reactants are not equal to the products. Okay. It is just the mathematically, well, well, symbolically how we express them. And this is also the stuff you must have had. First order reaction, <coughs> second order reaction. Should I jump through all this? No? All right, let me define a few things, yeah. The first type of elementary reaction is known as the unimolecular reaction. It involves one reactant. <coughs> it can undergo isomerization or dissociation. For example, H2 as a molecule dissociating a two hydrogen atom belongs to this process. At, at an elementary level, it doesn't happen that way, and we'll get into that later. So for a first order reaction, uh, the rate law states that the disappearance, disappearance rate of this reactant is directly proportional to its concentration. Multiplied by proportionality is the rate constant. Again, this count derives from the linearized phenomenological law of cause and effect. Because A exists, it has a tendency to react, destroy it itself through a unimolecular reaction then its rate must be proportional, to, be proportional to the concentration of the self. The proportionality is the rate constant. The square blocket represents molar concentration, typically expressed in kinetics with a unit of a mole per cubic centimeter. Okay. The rate constant, K in this case, should have a unit of one over a second. Therefore, it's a frequency factor for the disappearance of A. If K is not a function <coughs> of A, then it can be integrated to show that A, the concentration of the reactant, shall decay exponentially. As proportional, of course, to the initial concentration. Now, in general, unimolecular reactions occur because of a collision of this molecule with a third body. Take a nitrogen molecule in the air. It has no reason to dissociate until something kicks into it. 
dump so much energy into it to the point that its oscillation, the amplitude, becomes so large that a poke over this potential energy well for it to get out. Once it pokes the head out, you know, the two atoms will leave each other, perhaps permanently and forever. But you'll require some energy dumping into the A molecule. So the other way to express unimolecular reaction is you require the third body, typically expressed by M. And then in this case, the disappearance rate of A is again proportional to the concentration of the self and the concentration of the third body. And in this case, it's a molar concentration of the gas. Okay. The second type of reaction is known as the second order bimolecular reaction. You have two reactants, A, physically collide into B. You ask how fast A and B disappear. And in general, the reaction rate is described by molar conservation principle. The disappearance rate of A is equal to the disappearance rate of a B and should be proportional to the concentration of both. And this equation should have no analytical solution except for some special cases. When A is A, that is, molecules can react among themselves, then this expression becomes one half of dA dt is Ka squared. You can solve this to show the time dependency of A with respect to time is given by this expression. Therefore, it's, a sti it's not an exponential decay function, but it is still a decay function with respect to roughly 1 over t. Okay. Now, the other case that we utilize quite often in measuring reaction rate constant all right, is to apply the pseudo first order principle. You have two reactants, A and B. You flood the system with lots and lots of B, very little A. So by the time A is consumed completely, the concentration of a B stays roughly the same. And that becomes a pseudo first order reaction because B is a constant. So when you go up to that expression, K times B becomes a pseudo ray constant called a K prime and this whole thing follows first order kinetics. That is, the time evolution of concentration of A is again given by this decay function, exponential decay function. Okay. Now, two molecular reaction, as we discussed before, is a highly unlikely. The probability is so small that it, usually we don't account for it. Okay. Now, this is also something you've had before, the law of mass action. That is, if you look at a generic reaction with the reactants A and B, product C and D, the forward rate, rate is given as a case of F, that's a forward rate constant multiplied by reactant concentration. The back is KB times C and D. The net reaction rate for A and B to disappear is that for corresponding to production of a C and a D, that's a time derivative given here. And it is the result of net reaction rate, R sub F minus R sub B, okay? And that's given by this expression. Under equilibrium condition, equilibrium, we talked about this yesterday, is not static. Equilibrium is dynamic. For the number of moles of A consumed to form the product. There will be equal number of mole of product be transformed back into the reactant. The result is that the forward rate and the backward rates are equal. And that's equilibrium condition when you have the two rates are equal. It follows that if based on this expression, the ratio of forward rate constant and a back rate constant given by the ex equilibrium expression itself is related to the equilibrium constant. Therefore, Kf over Kb is the equilibrium constant itself. <coughs> all right, we all know that stuff, right? Now, there, let me make a comment. All right, you can read me whatever you want. 
there are quite many papers lately, quite five years, um, using reaction models and mathematics to predict a variety of experimental observations. From reacted on the planks and the plane structure and the plane speed, distinctions can be conditioned and I'm pretty sure many of you found some of that simulation. Occasionally you have to deal with a real human. Occasionally, you have to develop your own reaction mechanisms, and more so today, I found the practice of merging two reaction models, or merging two reaction mechanisms from two sets of research groups together. Okay? Have you seen anything like that? Don't do it. Why it's dangerous? It's dangerous because the very reason you combine two reaction mechanisms is because there are sections of the two mechanisms don't overlap. But they must be related to each other, otherwise they will forever stay as two separate reaction mechanisms. They must have shared species. Shared species must have shared reactions. Shared reactions now you have a problem. Which set of thermal chemistry do you use? You have model A, that is model B. Are you sure when you combine the two reaction mechanisms, you check every thermal chemical property to make sure they are the same? If they're the same, there's no problem. If they're not the same, what pharmacy you're doing wrong in this whole thing? destroying this relationship. If the thermal chemical data, suppose A and B are species you found in model A. C and D are species you found in model B. They have different assumptions made for thermal chemical property of A and B and C and D. Right? They may not be consistent. If you combine this whole thing together, how do you show this relationship is a thing? And indeed, a lot of time when this happened, I can tell you that I've seen many times that a flame doesn't want to converge. Why would it come converge? It's because hemping takes only the forward ray constant, right? The back ray constant is computed by green constant. When you introduce inconsistent thermodynamic expression uh, properties, which are subsequently used to determine the equilibrium constant, when you mess up with the back rate constant, hey, who is to say the back rate constant is less important than the forward rate constant? If you do a flux analysis, you often find that reactions moving in forward direction, by and large, and you also find other reactions Careful with that. Be very, very careful with that. And I can tell you that my own, every time I review a paper, this is often the things I confirm. Watch your battery constant. The fundamental reason for that is if you're not careful with thermal chemistry, the battery constant, the forward array constant expression, may come from some compilation coming from a credible source. Your back ray constant might have no credibility. So that's a common issue. Let's, let's take a break. Think about it. I'll move on to talk about the chain reaction mechanism and a steady state.